Because as someone who's not asexual but has considered whether I fit into the category of rare at various points, the head thing thing's something I can really relate to. And as I've gone around talking to people about my research, I sorry, can I put this away actually? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, in my talk, can everyone Yeah. Hey, okay. Uh, yeah, so I mean, it's this whole idea of the head clicky thing and the change when you do suddenly understand what someone is talking about when they describe themselves as asexual. Because when I first came, I first came across asexuality when I had to make friends with two people who are asexual, and it was in talking to one of them in particular that I started to realise how interesting I found the concept, but also how confusing I found the concept. But in a classical research style, also how interesting I found my own confusion. <laughs> because at the time, I'd just finished doing an MA dissertation about sexual identity, so I spent months reading all this academic literature about sexuality. And the absence of, not just of asexual people, but the absence of the consideration of the possibility that there could be asexual people was so glaringly conspicuous once I noticed it, that that came to fascinate me as well. And in my, you know, when I started my research, I set out just to try and get some basic qualitative data about the asexual community. Because at that point, which I think was four years ago now, it was striking, firstly, how little research there was, but secondly, how little it seemed to have occurred to these researchers to actually ask asexual people, what is it like to be asexual? <laughs> You know, there's a great deal of uh, value to a lot of psychological research, I'm not dismissing it by any means, but the tradition of research that I come in from is about actually talking to people, understanding how they experience the world, how they see themselves in their own terms. And I found that a really interesting movement where simultaneously I'd expected the asexual community, because I was talking about it as a community and other people talked about it as a community, to be homogenous, or at least to have some sort of really core, unified identity. And yet it soon became apparent just how diverse the asexual community is at the same time, and how the same processes which, as people were drawn to it and they talked about their shared experiences and their divergent experiences online, how they simultaneously seemed to entrench some degree of shared identity, but also help people recognise and identify their differences. And yet, you know, the community seemed to seem to become stronger in the process. But I, you know, in my research and from reading online and from other conversations I've had and other things people have told me since, you know, there are some near universal experiences that asexual people have. And one of them, as far as I'm aware, is the experience of bewilderment, non-comprehension, when asexual people try and tell sexual people about their asexuality. The sense in which many sexual people, <coughs> including myself in this, they just don't get it. You know, some people might just be unpleasant bastards who are acting prejudiced ways because they just like stigmatise. But I think that a lot of the time, things people, reactions people have to asexuality can often be a, a result of that lack of comprehension. That because they literally, on a conceptual level, on an intellectual level, do not get asexuality as a concept. They act in ways which are inadvertently stigmatizing and marginalizing. And so I think that the head picky thing <laughs> is at the root of a lot of this. Because I, I've tried to write about this in terms of what I've called the sexual assumption. The presupposition that sexual attraction is uniform and it's universal. So that everyone experiences sexual attraction and it's the same thing in all cases. And what I take the head picky thing, and apologies, I'm going to start using that phrase a lot, <laughs> to mean is that experience of when you realise that assumption is not true. And if you're not yourself asexual, and you suddenly realise that the sexual assumption isn't the case, you start to reflect in a way that previously isn't possible about your own sexuality. And 
you know, I think in a way that the emergence of data structure community, and particularly the very rich language that has emerged and is continuing to emerge out of these discussions, both offline and online, it creates cultural resources which exist objectively independently of their creators. You know, they're things that are put out there into the world that other people can pick up and use to make sense of themselves. And they're obviously of use to the asexual community, but I think they're of a lot of use to the sexual community as well, because the sexual community, what does that mean? You know, there's no good word to talk about sexual people. I tend to vacillate between saying non-asexuals and sexual people. If you see what I mean, I think there's an absence of an identity as sexual. And the asexual community is playing an integral part in creating the conditions in which people who are not themselves asexual will come to reflect in a way they haven't previously about what their sexuality means. So in a similar way, for instance, to how it took the emergence of people calling themselves homosexual, homosexual for heterosexual to emerge as an identity. In terms of what that label refers to, there were obviously already heterosexual people. But in terms of actually labeling that, until there was a recognition that there was some other, that there were people who weren't this way, it didn't make sense for anyone to call themselves heterosexual, to think of themselves as straight. And you can see this in both the gap between etymologically the words heterosexual and homosexual were coined at the same time in a, a translation by the same person. And yet, homosexual came into public use a lot earlier than heterosexual came into everyday public use. And similarly, I'm really intrigued about the impact that the, all this increasing visibility of the asexual community is going to have on the, the wider discourses of sexuality in society. Because I, I think it's opening up space, and it's opening up a very rich and productive space, which is going to have a, a lot of impacts for a lot of people. Some small, some great, but all very significant. I think there really, really is a historical turning point in sexual culture and the how sexual culture changes over time. And a lot of it revolves around this head clicky thing. And as more people start to become aware of asexuality, become aware of asexuality I think it is making the world a much nicer, more tolerant place. And it's opening up the space within which people can recognise and crucially articulate the diversity which characterises sexual experience. Because at the moment, even when there is an identification of their sexual community, some people will still look at this in terms of a zero sum thing. You're either sexual or you're asexual. Whereas I think everyone, to varying degrees, is going to fall somewhere in between. But it's the lack of any language to identify that in between bit. Uh, yeah, thanks. So, sorry, that was a slightly rambling talk, but as I say, um, I rewrote it. <laughs> I've used the microphone since 10 years ago where people made me list names at an athletics event and I didn't actually <laughs> see the people I was talking to. So this is obviously isn't the case here. I've never talked to anyone who was so close to me. <laughs> so um, my talk is going to be a little bit different from Mark's because what I'm going to do is present you a very, very short and condensed version of my research, which is my PhD project. Um, so to give you a little bit of context, I'm based um, as a doctoral research student in the Center for Interdisciplinary Gender Studies at the University of Leeds. And that research center itself is housed in a department for sociology and social policy. So I'm also very much based in social research traditions, specifically feminist and queer methodologies. If that means anything to anyone. So, um, I'm at the end of my first year now, which is the stage at which I should kind of have um, a sort of proposal of what's going to happen. So if you know, my ethical approval goes through, my risk assessment goes through, then I'm going to start my field work um, in a few months. So, I also have very recently created a very nice pretentious working title, which is Asexual Intimate Borderlands, Exploring Boundaries and Liminal Spaces of Personal Relationships. And what that means 
Um, it's basically that I'm focusing on qualitative research on asexual experiences of intimacy. So um, the way Mark took off, um, took away the head clicky thing from David, I'm going to take the intimacy thing from David. <laughs> um, so I'm going to run you through three concepts that sort of make up the, well, the whole hypothesis, hopefully, alongside, um, alongside my quality of data and the interviews. And if I have time after that, I think I would like to talk a little bit about, um, about the process of doing research and about the frameworks in which that happens. Because I think um, if you're not an academic yourself and if you haven't really um, engaged with research yourself, um, this might be an area that might seem a bit shoddy to some people because um, a lot of the time social research might just be might, might have might give up the impression that you just you know go out find some TV, some people talk to them and they just you know invent something basically um, that's not actually how it happens so you know if we if we have time for that maybe we can <coughs> spend a few minutes on that so like I said um, I'm going to be focusing on asexual intimacies which means that I need to define or define my concept of intimacy which is very much geared towards effective social relations. I want to talk about relationships of strong emotional quality, of personal significance, and um, relationships in which there is trust between people and possibility for vulnerability. And um, if any of you know Adrian Rich, who's an American poet, I'm not sure if he recently died or not, but um, <laughs> um, she used um, this concept of survival relationships in a paper from 1980 which was one of the first papers that talked about um, about the fact that writings about gay male experiences don't actually reflect the experiences of lesbian women. And what she talked about was that in survival relationships, women form strong emotional bonds with other women, meaning with people who are not their spouses, in order to, um, in order to find more emotional fulfillment. Um, and this is partially what, what, my, what my concept of intimacy is about. Because if you look at academic literature, um, you will see intimacy as very strongly tied to love, especially romantic love, which is in turn very much connected with the erotic. So you have, um, you can go very far back talking about love. You have these, um, you know, ancient Greek categories of eros and philia and agape, which you know then developed into um, worshipful love. Um, and you also you have um, today the concept of platonic love, which is sometimes I think related to asexuality. Um, so what I want to do is look at these categories that exist and sort of not apply but merge them with asexuality and see what happens. Because usually what I hear from asexual people and what I hear from other people who aren't necessarily asexual um, and what I see from my own experience is that when um, is that the actual reality of people's relationships don't necessarily doesn't necessarily reflect how these categories get construed. So um, there's two authors from London here, actually, Rosemary Budgen, who talk about the friendship romance divide, that there is um, no real terminology to talk about relationships that transcend romance and friendship or that, you know, that find some sort of mixture of the two. I think in the asexual community, there is the term of zucchini. Um, so um, that shows a bit the need to invent new terms in order to um, be able to adequately reflect people's lives. So um, I want to bring asexuality into um, a discussion of intimacy and hopefully arrive at a possibility to reconceptualize the term of intimacy. Um, and it's quite interesting for me to be here at a predominantly activist event, which you know deals a lot with identity politics, and you know they just talked about community cohesion and these all these things, um, which all very much hinges on the possibility that people can identify as asexual. Um, 
And this is partly what I want to do in my research, which is um, I want to talk to people who identify as asexual, but I also want to talk to people who fall into a category of what I think CJ Chesson has called potentially asexuals, which are people who may practically be asexual but who do not use the terminology or who don't want to use the terminology, people who relate to other people asexually, which is actually something that's really common if you think about it. Because when you go back to the idea of intimacy, what happens is that um, the absence of sexuality is only considered weird or strange if it's in a romantic relationship or a relationship that's traditionally sexual. If you think about, um, if you think about what's common in a sibling relationship, for example, the idea that that could even be sexual in some regard is a complete taboo in this culture, and especially you know if there's a possibility involved that there might be children uh, or anything like that. So asexuality is actually something that's really pervasive. I mean, we are relating now asexually, and not just because the majority of you is asexual. Um, so, you know, you will notice that I'm not a big Freudian, even though I'm from Vienna. Um, so, um, eventually I want to relate um, the concept of asexuality and intimacy to the idea of the possibility of an intimate citizenship. I don't know if any of you are familiar with the concept of a sexual, sexual citizenship. It's basically um, ideas around the legal regulation of personal relationships in private lives. And what happens at the moment is that um, in terms of intimacy, there is a strong focus um, on recognizing a certain kind of relationships, namely uh, relationships that can be termed a marriage or a civil partnership which are always um, assumed to be romantic and therefore assumed to be sexual. So um, what I hope to achieve eventually um, through my research is to sort of bring up a discussion that intimacy um, is not, I don't want to bring, I don't, I'm not necessarily concerned with bringing up a legal recognition of asexual relationship as su relationships as such, because I'm a bit wary of going in that direction. What I'm rather concerned with is, you know, acknowledging and getting other people to acknowledge that people's primary or relation, uh, primary or significant close personal relationships, whatever they are, must not necessarily be sexual or romantic. undergrad thesis on asexuality on Avon, um, so kind of small fry in, in the broad context of asexual research, but nonetheless I did do a part. And I'm just, well, like uh, you, you just did, my ladies, uh, sorry, um, I'm just going to talk about my research and what I wrote, and uh, yeah. So firstly I should run through the methods that I used. Um, I, study or I just finished studying anthropology, and the going method in anthropology is called ethnography. And if you're unfamiliar with that, it basically means going into a group setting and talking to the people there and hanging out with them and recording your observations. It's basically a kind of deep hanging out. You just sit around chatting and take notes, like nothing more than that. But because anthropologists you know, need a kind of technical term for everything, we call it participant observation and all this sort of stuff. So I, I took part in Avon forums as anyone else, and at the time, if a handful of you probably might have seen me there, I had this giant red warning in my uh, in my forum signature to let everyone know that I was kind of snooping around on them and, <laughs> and then looking at what you guys are up to. I'm not actually asexual. Um, I a friend of mine is asexual, and they directed me to Avon uh, before I obviously before I decided to write my thesis on it, and I was just kind of fascinated by the. The new the language that was developing and the way people were talking about it, like, right? and it was something that I'd I'd heard the term about once before, a few years before, but I never actually looked into it, and it was kind of fascinating as a sexual person the divisions that are made. Uh, so I decided to explore that, and I undertook an ethnography and did that. And basically, from looking at the experiences of asexuals, and although all, every asexual story is kind of different, I did see some commonalities. And I led, was led to the conclusion that asexuality isn't a way to be a person in much of the online world. 
and it's only been in the last about 10 years or so with, uh, with Avon and with the live journal page and so on that asexuality has been made into a new category of personhood and a way to interact with others as a person. And I'm going to go into that, but first I need to kind of like give a kind of basic theoretical background, which I really hope doesn't bore you. But, and I have to take this all the way over to a discussion about autism, just to illustrate the point, but it's, it's nothing to do with asexuality itself. But uh, basically, a philosopher called Ian Hacking wrote a great article about making up people, and he specifically takes autism. Autism is a disorder or a spectrum of disorders characterized by social difficulties, language impairment, an obsession with literalness and maintaining the same order, and a bunch of other stuff. Uh, it's not particularly important to set down a proper definition, I'm just making the example. But his point is that autism was introduced as a diagnosis in about the 1940s, and, uh, and began to be given to more and more people in, in throughout the 1950s and so on and, and so forth. But it doesn't make sense to say that there, are, there were more autists after the 1950s, or that there were no autists before 1950 and now there are lots. Because autism is a name we give to a condition or a set of symptoms. And those symptoms would have existed in the population, presumably, before the, the diagnosis was made. So rather, it's not that autism didn't exist, it's that autism wasn't a way to be a person. People didn't experience themselves as autists. They didn't interact with those autists. They didn't talk to their friends and family and employers and counselors and so on as autists. But after the 1950s, people began to do that. It became a category, a category of personhood within which one, one could live and interact. And a similar kind of thing is, is at work with asexuality now. And this is kind of tied into sexual identity more broadly and the history of how we think about sex and sexuality. Michel Foucault is one of the, he's basically the big daddy of modern Western analysis of sex. And he wrote this landmark work, uh, which he never, he, he died before he could finish it, but he wrote The History of Sexuality. And in it he talks about how the idea of sexual orientation was kind of born in, in, from the 16th century onwards. And at that time, experts began to examine sexuality as an objective phenomenon and a, an object of science. They began to categorize and classify different kinds of sexuality and types of people. And before that, you didn't, people didn't talk or think about themselves as existing within these categories. If you went back, he, he specifically uses the example of the Greeks. If you went back in time to them and said, I am attracted to men, or I'm attracted to the opposite sex, they'd be like, all right, we, sure we all are, we all have, have a bit of sex with men like, because they didn't, it was, well, they did. They're constantly going at it. But uh, for them, it was more about practices and behaviors, and they did have uh, names for specific roles, basically, and so on, and they did have associations, it, it, but it was considered ethically unhealthy to engage in certain kinds of behaviors, rather than being part of an intrinsic attraction. And throughout the 17th and 20th centuries, as these experts began to make concrete sexological categorizations of sexual orientations, people's identities became more and more tied up with what their orientation was. And actually, like Marx said, first the homosexual was created as this, as this kind of person, and then in counter to that, the, the heterosexual, and now we have the bisexual and a bunch of other ones like pansexuality and so on. So and at the, between the 17th and 20th centuries, a new kind of sexual subjectivity was forming, where people look at themselves as categories of person in terms of sexuality. And before that, people didn't think about it. And I can now tie this back into what this actually has to do with asexuality. And the thing is that asexuality doesn't exist in most of the world as a, as a category of personhood in the same way that those do. If you, if you as you go through life, you, you, know, you go through puberty and so on, you have strange feelings and urges and so on or whatever. Maybe you don't, maybe most people in this room didn't. But you have certain feelings for certain people and society gives you, what you could say, maps of what your orientation is. You know, there's heterosexual and bisexual and homosexual and sometimes a few other less well-known ones. But that's not the case for asexuality. You guys just haven't had that for a long time. And so, for, for most of us, we go through life, especially if you're heterosexual, it's quite easy. But you go through life, you have certain feelings, and then you have a name for yourself. With, with asexuality, it's like if someone's asking you, what's your orientation? And then they say, you know, you can have straight, gay or bi, or 
gay or lesbian and bi. And then you, there's no like none of the above option for you guys. <laughs> but then, in you know around the turn of the millennium, uh, the larger starting with the um, Nash, where is he? You, you, you did a, the great history of the asexual movement. So I'm not going to repeat that. But asexuality began to take form slowly and to turn into what it is now, and the lack of sexual attraction. And suddenly people had a way to be a person and to interact with each other and to talk about themselves as asexuals. And I mean, you can really easily see this on the forums in terms of... Uh, sorry, I forgot what I was going to say. <laughs> uh, in terms, firstly, of people's reactions to asexuals coming out as asexual. People in the offline world, and also in terms of people, what they thought of themselves before they discovered asexuality and discovered that that was a viable way to be a person. And in terms of the latter, I mean, I'm sure if any of you have ever told someone you're asexual, probably some of them were understanding and accepting and just were like, okay, that's fine. And then some of them had like totally adverse reactions, like just like, like what people were discussing earlier. You should get your home, hormones checked. You must have been sexually abused. There's something wrong with you. It's just a phase. You need to meet the right person. It's just because you're still a virgin. And if you're not still a virgin, you just, you just need to have really good sex. <laughs> you, you, like, transform into a sexual, like a magic butterfly. Or <laughs> I, don't, I don't fucking get it. Like, <laughs> But it, it, it just reflects that there's no place for asexuality. If you discuss it with most people in the online world, they don't consider it a viable way to be a person. And as well as that, the way asexuals sometimes feel before they discover it. And that again was saying that earlier, he had very low self-esteem, he felt like he was broken. You often get people talking about how they conflated their romantic attraction with sexual attraction and didn't understand that it wasn't sexual. Or people who conclude that because they're not heterosexual, they must be homosexual. So for asexuals, or potential asexuals, there can be a lot of headaches about how to see yourself, because there's no term for you. And then, of course, you go online and you discover asexuality, and of course it's not the same for everyone, because some people are still, uh, still, have, still are trying to figure themselves out, and you know, you've got whole gray asexual categories. But if you hang out in the introduction section on Avon, you'll see loads of people who are just like, I just found out about asexuality, and instantly, it just absolutely clicked. I know who I am now. Finally, I have a word to describe myself, and I'm not alone. And it's at that point that asexuality becomes a way to be a person, and you can describe yourself as an asexual. You can say, I'm asexual, and talk to people as an asexual, interact with others as an asexual, in a way that didn't exist before. So basically, my thesis is about that, and about how Avon and other websites act as the grounds for the making of that new category of person. That's it. Okay, so question time. Raise your hands. Nobody? Or are you still trying to process what it is you want to ask? Oh, okay. Um, well, as a part of this uh, academic research, you need to find out previous academic research that was done. And I think many of us are curious, because you did the yearly researching, what did you found as academic study material that existed before you? Uh, to all of us? You're doing academic work. <laughs> you? Well, okay. Um, how do I go? <laughs> well, you know, um, I'm not sure what the first, okay, let me think, I think the first piece of research that I found that used the term asexuality that wasn't about plants or fungi or algae, <laughs> I think was somewhere in the 1970s maybe, there's this, um, there's this paper by Paul Nourius who um, relates a lack of sexual attraction, a lack of sexual desire to um, um, depression, low self-esteem, and it's it's not a very it's not a specifically very good paper. I think, especially in terms of asexuality, but this is like one of the first things I've found. I think if you were start if you if you were starting to look now, what you would find um, 
is, I think, especially with the advent, with the development of the asexual community, social research and psychological research that starts using um, the definition of asexual as someone who doesn't experience sexual attraction. I think this is the main sort of trend that's happening now, especially with people who um, maybe are themselves asexual and use the topic in, uh, you know, in their bachelor's thesis or their master's thesis. Um, and yeah, in terms of what people have published, I think there is there's sort of a surge of research that's going on right now. If you want to read something really good, uh, read stuff by Mark because I haven't published anything yet. <laughs> um, uh, just, yeah, uh, do you know Andrew Hensel? I don't know how to say his name. Which is, uh, yeah, Andrew H is in my head. Uh, but I mean, his website is actually Explorations. I found fantastic because when I started to think I want to try and do some research on this, I typed asexual research into Google. Um, within 10 hits, I found the full bibliography. <laughs> 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 yeah. yeah, so if you're interested, the site's fantastic because, I mean, he updates it very regularly. I think it's still completely comprehensive. It has everything that anyone's done listed on there. English language, at least. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I don't know, they pretty much covered it up. Can you give me a Anyone else have any questions? Yeah, we're a microphone or we're now, I should be fine. Um, for the non ace uh, researchers, did you have any problems um, researching things because you don't, you're not ace, so you don't really, you know? Did you have any problems researching something that you couldn't Actually understand feel. as well as some who says? Um, well, personally, no. I didn't, I didn't perceive any problems myself, and I can understand why you might think that. But uh, anthropology, specifically, has a history of examining things that have nothing to do with us. Like, I mean, anthropology is descended from guys going over to Papua New Guinea and just like talking to those guys, and then usually in the beginning being really, really racist. <laughs> yeah, it was really, really bad. Uh, so, not a good heritage there. But, um, I didn't find it, I didn't find it particularly difficult to try to understand asexuals. Uh, I like to think I'm fairly open-minded, and I just, I just assumed that the way I look at most people uh, uh, who I'm not sexually attracted to, and I just like, Took that dial and just put it up to 100% and imagine that that's what it's like for asexuals. Is, is that is that good? <laughs> Alright. And um, and so I I thought I'd uh, I, I think I had fairly okay understanding of asexuals. Uh, so no, but I have to say that researching asexuals is personally of great interest to me because for the first time I, it, it made salient this uh, separation between romantic attraction and sexual attraction. And in, in most of the, in the general schema of sexuality we have in the Western world is that these are both the same thing. You know, when you talk about homosexuals, you're talking about people who are attracted romantically and sexually to the opposite or the same sex, and vice versa for heterosexuality. And no one bothers to differentiate it because it's the same thing to, to most of us. And I never realized that I took that for granted. And then suddenly I'm on Egan, I'm like, hey, never, never thought of that. <laughs> but yeah, so. Oh, I was wondering if anyone else would comment too. Um, yeah, what you said at the end, likewise. <laughs> you know, very similar experience. Really eye-opening. Yeah. Okay. And I think it's fun being a friend with people in terms of actually talking about why I was starting to find this so interesting about the categories and finding the different categories available to you to make sense of your own experience don't fit. And although there is some overlap in my experience, there's also divergence, but I've got a lot of experience in other, other areas of my life having that experience, I just try to be as open as I could about that. Because I think it is an experience that goes beyond the asexual community. So I'm really interested in the intersections that come up already with the trans community and also the poly community. Because mm -hmm. I've read a lot of trans research and know a few people doing work in the area in the last year or so. And there just seems to be a lot of experiential overlap where it, it just doesn't fit. You know, the categories available in everyday language just don't work to make sense and articulate who you are. Yeah, I have uh, like a question. Like, you are talking about asexuality from most of us, most of you, as I like, can see, like, not a non asexual point of view. So, you explain to other non asexual people. And, like, you saw, like, the quick thing from David. And sometimes, um, once I met uh, someone in Aiden chat, and he tried to explain to me asexual attraction. 
which is a very long story, we're not the beginning now, but he told me that like trying to explain sexual attraction to asexuals is like trying to explain the difference between green and brown to colorblind people. And I thought about the colorblind example, and it was pretty good. Like we see colors, like colorblind people see colors, but don't really understand, don't really see the difference between some of the colors. So like we don't really see hot people, you know? So I was thinking like, how do you, what kind of metaphors do you use to explain asexuality to non-asexual people from a non-asexual point of view? Um. <laughs> Like we're talking to the media and stuff, like, and, and to, like in conversations with friends, because I mean, this is, as I said, this is where part of my interest comes from. Because people have asked me, yeah, so what are you researching these days? Asexuality, mm -hmm. what is that, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. So it's in that com that context and with the media that I try to say stuff. And I think I just tended to fall back on the story that we've been told, and particularly I mean, because it's both useful and perhaps the bad thing about research, the the generalisations about those stories, so not specifically talking about particular individuals, so the tendencies that I've observed of the kinds of stories that have been told. So it gives people something to relate to, but I think there is that conceptual barrier, and I don't know if there are metaphors that help people get it. It tends to be, I don't know, that people have to just hear stories and it sits with them for a while, and then they start to realise, like, well, hey, this is how I like, I've experienced it, but I can sort of imaginatively, empathically put myself in the shoes of someone who is other. Okay. You know, it's not that you suddenly see the colours yourself, it's that you can imagine what it is like oh, yeah. to see the colours, you see what I mean. But if, if you have to do an elevator pitch, you would just have to explain what asexuality is in like five sentences or two sentences, what's your elevator pitch? Uh, spectrum, usually I guess, to be honest. Um, which in, you know, for convoluted reasons, in, with my research hat on, as opposed to a person doing elevator hat on, I, I'm not that keen on the spectrum idea. But I think that helps get it across to people. But, you know, because I, I think people intuitively recognise there is much more diversity to our personal experience, and all meaning the broadest sense of the term all, then we have the resources available to articulate in language. And I think maybe on that level people can relate to, to a certain extent, to not being able to articulate yourself, you know, not being able to say who you are. Because I think everyone has that experience to varying degrees, but the way culture is structured means systematically some people are in that position much more than others. Okay. And person over there, hand up. Thank you. Um, I thought it was really interesting how all of the microphone. Um, I thought it was interesting how each of you in your uh, research. Um, had said in your own way about this thing of compartmentalizing people and conditions and aspects of humanity and various other things. Um, I, I work as a social research 